Hi, good evening, and in some cases, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us from pretty much across the world and across time zones for this uh, brand new session of the Real Deal. Uh, we promise you a very interesting and more importantly, a very thought-provoking next sixty odd minutes with our esteemed panelists. Uh, though they need absolutely no introductions, let me do a very very quick round. Uh, you know, for the benefit of anyone who may not, you know, who may be sort of new to the organization. So we're joined today by our chairperson and MD uh, Nisa, um, hey. our, our CEO for Indian Stock, and my boss, Mr. Sunil Kataria. Hi everyone. Um, Mr. Bhavesh Gordon, uh, who's a cluster head for the Gom Cluster. Hi and, guys. Thanks, Nisa, Bhavesh, and Sunil for uh, you know joining us for this session. Um, it's absolutely my privilege for hosting you know to be hosting this session today, and it's a very special day because. Usually, I'm at the receiving end of all the questions from Nisa and Sunil. Um, today, I get an opportunity to ask them all the questions. So I'm going to make the most right. So, uh, we'll be talking about a topic that's probably the core to the existence of us as humans, uh, you know, to our relationships and to organizations, which is respect. Uh, you know, it's a core value uh, for us at Fordridge. Uh, the key tenets being that you know we treat people. Like the way we would want to be treated, we embrace um, and celebrate diversity, and we foster collaboration. And with that, we come to the first segment where I'd like to ask each of our three panelists, what does respect really mean to you, both as an individual and as a leader? So, Nisa, starting with you. Um, I think Anuja, for me, actually, more than you know, treating people the way you would like to be treated, because we are, we are all very different. It's uh, can you actually treat them the way they would like to be treated? And, you know, that means knowing them. That means having a sense of empathy. And at the very basic, I think, treating people with a lot of dignity. I think that's uh, very, very critical when it comes to respect. Thanks, Nisa. Uh, Sunil, what would respect mean to you? Actually, uh, you know, there's a very interesting quote I had read a long time back, uh, which I thought uh, always stayed with me. That respect actually is a reflection. Showing respect is a reflection of your own character and not for so, of somebody else's character. So I think uh, that's a very deep one, and that always stayed with me. For me, actually, respect uh, means three things. You know, one in the interaction being very authentic, second being caring for the people, and third being fair. So I think these are the three words I would attach to respect here. Oh, thanks so much. Um, Dhanesh, coming to you, uh, you know, how would you really sort of talk about respect uh, and what it really means to you? Yeah, you know, I, when, when I listen to Sunil, it, it, it resonates so much with me what Sunil just said, right? But I think it's also uh, accepting the imperfect me and I will equally accept the imperfect you. And I think the it's really about that we are all human beings. We all have feelings. We all have emotions. We all have bad days and good days. Uh, we do right things and wrong things. And accepting that as a pathway to go forward is more important than not being happy with something I've done or something I've said. So I think it's, it's really the, when we start embracing imperfection in some way as human beings are, uh, I think that opens up a whole new avenue of, of growth, personally, uh, um, professionally, for all of us. I can almost sense people taking notes, right? With those, with those thoughts that that all few of you have sort of just put out. It's it's beautiful because you know I think all three of you had such diverse, um, uh, you know, articulation of what respect means, but fundamentally. It boils down to acceptance. It boils down to letting people have their own space. And I think it boils down eventually to your own personal character. So I think really thank you so much for setting the context. Um, Misa, now coming uh, you know, to you as, as a leader uh, you know, of the organization, how do you, uh, you know, how would you like respect to be manifested um, you know, across the organization? What, what, would it, what does it mean to you? And more importantly, since you're carrying the legacy of Godrej Misa, uh, you know, how, what are the kind of things that you would want to change and what are the kind of things that you would not want, you know, us to change when it comes to respect? Yeah, so I think, I think for Godridge, uh, you know, as a company, as a group, I think things like, you know, humility, integrity, respect 
are very important and they always have been so i think the it's not just the what but the how has always been very important that being said you know is the how every day completely perfect i would say not correct and i think what dharnesh actually talked about mm-hmm. imperfection and accepting imperfection um uh, you know i'd build on that and actually say yes we are imperfect but respect is also a muscle that you build correct you can get better and better at it every example um one of the first sort of uh, you know feedbacks that i had got when i was working this was in my 20s and i think someone had done feedback um for me and they were like you know you need to smile much more when you walk in the corridors and uh, you know you're very tactical you you just get to the point and you you should ask people about their children and i mean i remember that time saying why should i smile when in the middle of a turn around what is there to i mean i i used to think like that and and like okay maybe i'll try smiling but why would i ask anyone about that and you know i was quite a few years away from uh, having children so i think you can you know it's not and i don't think i was ever meant badly or meant that's why i said it's not about just treating people the way you would want to be treated because maybe i didn't mind people not smiling at me or no i didn't have children so there was no problem but i think it's 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 really building and i think respect is tied into so many things correct right? because with respect you listen you're more inclusive uh you create a better environment to work so it's very it's very important not just for the individual but the health of the organization i think one thing that i'd like us to do more of is give more feedback to each other right because feedback is a gift i am sure that they at least you know if i'm being nice to myself five times a day for something or the other someone didn't like what i did or what i said now maybe you don't want to sort of come and tell me about each of those five occasions yeah. but you know if someone was doing it once a day at least or saying um you know early on in the pandemic i sent this email out to the strategy team which i thought was a uh polite email and uh, you know jishnu called me back and said that's like really demotivating and this is not how you manage this team and i had no idea correct so i called and i apologized so i think if people give you feedback um you have that ability to change and it is a muscle i don't think that there's anyone who's perfect at respect day in and day out so what i'd like to really see for godridge is for us to be open about this give a lot of feedback um so that you know all of us can learn from each other where we could be better thanks nita so you know clearly i think giving and equally taking feedback uh, in one stride is an important aspect of building respect i must tell you something nita i don't know if you know but a small anecdote uh, i was once on leave on a friday and you had apparently dropped an email for some information that you needed and i had missed that email because i hadn't checked my mail and i only checked it over the weekend i finally responded on monday with a big apology saying i'm sorry nita i'm late and you know and you responded saying sorry for what Uh, you know, and I said no, but you asked for it on Friday, and I'm responding on a Monday. Yeah, you know, it's, it's perfectly fine. Now, you know, I think in my head, uh, you know, it it was really a big thing that was playing on. But I think when I sort of shared that very openly with you, and you comforted me, saying that you know it's perfectly okay, I don't expect you to respond yeah. on the weekend. It suddenly made things so much yeah. easier. And I think there was such a you know such a fact, such a sort of articulation of mutual respect in a way. Like, you know you're respecting the other individual's time and yeah. uh, so and I think Anuja and sorry I mean I'm interrupting yeah. you which is not very yeah. respectful but I think these are very small actually things that you can learn so yeah. I realized that a lot of people if I actually sent an email on the weekend or whatever thought they had to reply immediately correct so then I started qualifying that you know I need it by this date it's not or just then i just stop sending emails on weekend i put everything in a draft folder to go out on monday morning so i think these are the small tweaks we can, i mean one thing i learned from vivek is i learned how to say hello how is your weekend hope you had a good weekend whatever because my style is like i'll read an email 
then I'll actually write without saying hello, how are you? How are the kids? Here's my smiley face. This is what it is. And then I actually go back and add some of that stuff. But I'm saying, I'm just, I'm just saying for everyone out there, we can we can all be improving and learning and and we can only do that if we watch other people do it or we get the feedback. Otherwise it's a blind spot. Now I'm gonna stop Thank talking you too much. much. Uh, you know, those candid anecdotes because I think that just helps everyone else around. So then turning over to you, uh, you know, as a, as a leader of the largest business and that, you know, comprises multiple scale functions, how do you ensure that the codes of respect are practiced and manifested in a very, in, you know, in a very similar fashion, you know, so whether it be the HO where, you know, there is obviously a little bit of, you know, more guarded behavior, I'd say, versus let's say the plants or even at the distributor points, because eventually those are all, uh, you know, those are all areas that eventually belong to us and people there are a brand ambassador. So, so how would you as a leader, uh, you know, try to ensure that standardization in some sense and how we pursue respect and, and fully be respectful to people? So I, th I think uh, instead of using the word standardization, you know, because uh, I mean, we are dealing with people here, right? Yeah. That's the first thing, you know, uh, the person who's supposed to show respect and the other person who's again, supposed to show respect back, they're all different human beings, different people who come from so many different things. And like what Nisa tweaked that line, you know, say it's, you would like to be treated the way you treat the person, the way that person likes to be treated. So I think uh, there cannot be a standardized way of having a policy towards respect. Or show this, you know. I think it's a phenomena which, as a culture, which one has to, uh, you know, keep on practicing, and it keeps on getting developed. So I think the first thing to my mind is, uh, given that there's so much of diversity of locations, there's so much of diversity of people, uh, this is something which cannot be mandated from the HO as one thing which will get as a process rolled out. No, it is something which has to be practiced right at the frontline leadership itself, first of all. So I think that's the first piece. And there, I think the, what can go, what goes a long way is to create a sensitization and awareness. Because finally, this is about people being aware. I've seen so many examples when people who you interact with, they, because there's from so many different backgrounds, so many different cultural, so many different upbringings, the very meaning of respect for one person can be very different from another. Right. So I think the way, the best way to go to, uh, towards it and the way we all try to keep on doing in every interaction is keep on making every leader, every person being aware of what does show respect mean from a Godrej point of view. And I think that is the first uh, biggest thing. And that is something which, I mean, while we do it, this in some very structured way, like talking about the Godrej way right for, at every possible opportunity. But I think more than that, I think day-to-day -day conversations and talking this openly, talking this at every time when you see any maybe aberration or violation of what you think show respect has happened, talking openly about it, I think goes a long way. So for example, this real deal discussion, this itself to my mind is one of those, let's say, uh, you know, larger organization initiative to talk about it. But apart from this, what matters to my mind is that even let's say tomorrow when you're working with or dist, uh, working with a distributor or a distributed sales rep. And if I'm working the market and I'm certainly sensing that the way my field officer has talked to a DSR, right? Mm -hmm. Intentionally or unintentionally, and which I feel is actually not the way we would like the Godrej, uh, you know, uh, batch to be worn in the market. I think it's sure. important to just take that person aside, whether it's an ASM or field officer and just give us a concurrent feedback on the, on the point. Now, those kind of moments to mind are the ways to uh, you know, continuously build this, uh, you know, behavior apart from these, you know, HO level or the more structured interventions. Yeah. The second definitely, I think Nisa has already said, which I had thought in my mind is uh, that I, I think feedbacking is the most important uh, process because what I've seen is that A, nobody is perfect in, you know, practicing, showing respect, even if all intentions are right mm -hmm. all the time. Even the person who's embedded into this as a practicing that this is something I do it most often. There can be moments, there can be times that you will find you have erred. And hence, and the, the biggest thing which happens is you have erred and you have not realized it as well. Yeah. Most often than not, the second thing that I've realized is that most majority of people don't have bad intentions 
right? It's just that they end up erring and not realizing that they meant this way, the way it's got taken. So I think hence that second piece to amend is that consistent feedback is very important. There's a third point in the larger organization like ours, what also I feel happens is that there can be sometimes these lines can come in that within us, the, within inside the organization, where we see ourselves as employees, since there's so much of conversation happening about it, since there are some structured interventions happening, since we track this as GCF factors, uh, people tend to be more sensitive towards show respect as a critical value and hence day-to-day -day behavior. But in external, when we step out, there are relationships where there is a bit of a power play comes into place, which is very natural. Like for example, uh, in marketing, it can be marketing versus agency relationship, right? Uh, in manufacturing, it can be manufacturers versus vendor relationship. With the balance of power, which you know is maybe more towards the organization side, I've seen that is a tricky piece. You know, where what happens uh, that if you reflect back, many of us in our marketing roles or uh, in these vendor relationships with third party, that you see people tend to take this balance of power as uh, you know given, and respect can go a little out of the window at that time. So that to our mind is a very important piece to reinforce, which we keep on doing again and again, is that when we are dealing with people outside, especially, actually you as the GCPL ambassador, you're the, you're the biggest brand ambassador when you're spending out. Now that's another role to play. One is how to do it internally. The second, when you're spending, going outside, there's an added responsibility to our mind, which comes in. Within the organization, we are all Godrejites. The more you step out, we are a Godrejite dealing with another partner and there, we need to be demanding, but that demanding does not mean that we need not have the same respect as we would have for our own employees, our own peers. And that applies to even the frontline distributor salesman to a shop floor contract labor or to our agency creative teams or for that matter, third party manufacturers. So I think that's a message which I think is important that the way we treat internal, we need to make sure that our responsibility actually doubles up when we step outside. Great. No, I, I think that's, that's, that's a that's a fantastic point, Sunil, because I think all of us as employees, uh, aside just interacting with our peers and with our students, are constantly uh, in you know interacting with um, our partners outside of, of work. Uh, and you know, I think uh, thanks to sort of you know bringing that point in that we're all playing the role of brand ambassadors, uh, and our responsibility actually doubles up. Uh, you know, when when we when we are sort of talking to people or interacting with people outside of the organization. Dhanish, I'm coming to you, you know, on this question. So we spoke about, you know, cultural differences and being very cognizant of, you know, respect being interpreted very differently. So now, you know, you worked and lived across several countries. You know, you, you've seen, you know, you've worked in different cultures. How do you see respect, you know, manifest itself across cultures? What have been some of your learnings, you know, as far as being a leader uh, and navigating uh, different cultures and different, uh, you know, uh, people in different countries is concerned. And how have you seen uh, respect play out uh, and at times not play out, uh, you know, in a, in a situation like this? Thank you. So maybe I will use two examples. When I, during my time in, in Nigeria, as the first example, when I went to Nigeria, uh, the company had a, a guest house and I was stayed in the guest house. So in the morning, the driver came you know, took me to the airport, from the airport, took me to the guest house, lots of security, end of the and next morning he comes to pick me up and he says, good morning, sir, how was your night? And I'm thinking, what are you asking me, how was my night? And then, like, every time this would happen. And I, and I couldn't understand this concept of how was your night? Because, like, what are you asking me, you know, did I have a good sleep? Uh, I was trying to understand this. And then, you know, you got to realize it is, Showing respect, showing care, but the way the message came out, if I had a view that like I didn't understand what you meant, I, it could sound offensive or it could sound like uh, like intrusive, but really getting to understand it, where was the goodness of where it come from? And if I fast forward eight years later, the same driver every Friday, even up to now, sends me a WhatsApp message, how is family, how are... So Sunday is like... And, and I, think, I think one of the reasons why is uh, when his wife gave birth, he lived about 300 and some odd kilometers away from Lagos. And I heard him and 
the, the security in my car talking about on the Sunday, because he asked me, he says he won't work on Sunday and, and a backup driver would come. And he said, so he says, because they're having the christening ceremony, so the naming ceremony for his baby. And I know he invited them because I was beginning to understand a bit of Yoruba by, by then. And I said, Sunday, I am very upset. So he said, me, why are you upset? I said, you never invite me. And he says, oh, no, sir. It's a long, it's very far. It's in the village. And there's this thing where he says, no white men come to the village. For some reason, I was still classified as white. right? So I said, no, I have to come. And he says, no, okay. I said, no, I have to come. And I got another driver and security to take me for this thing. Okay, it's true. They've never seen somebody like me in this place. And I still have the most amazing picture with the baby. And, you know, but I, I tell you, for me, it was forget about what kind of house. It, but for he took care of me, protected me, drove me every day. And if I couldn't show his family the same level of respect, like I would do everyone else. And, and for me, I was so excited to go. And, but for him, it, it was like, like an honor to have me. And I said, it's not an honor. It is, it is a responsibility I have, right? So she like is my godchild. And, you know, uh, and, and I think that we, we have to take what, where do people come from? And there is a driver who has nothing else. And it is not just showing the respect and being respectful because he has to, because he can also do it without a smile. But to see somebody continue to do it the same spirit over the three and a half years I was there, was was it was really for me the most eye-opening thing that people are real, whatever level, whatever socioeconomic background, whatever language, uh, whatever cultural background they come from. But and if you open yourself up to the, that goodness, it's just an amazing thing. And it, so if I fast forward to or forward to Indonesia, you know, every morning in my you know I had like seven hundred people in the building and. You would, when I walk into the lift, Salamat Pagi, Salamat Pagi, Pa, it's like you get tired of greeting. And the beginning, I thought, what the hell, you know, do I have to greet everybody? And actually, now it became a thing where that smile that people have on their faces and when they greet you, I just realized it's the most wonderful thing that Indonesia is the most wonderful thing because it actually, even if I'm not in a good mood, I'm forced to greet and I'm forced to put on a smile because you can't say Salamat Pagi without smiling. It just doesn't, doesn't feel the same. So I'm, I'm demonstrating in a way that just being open to that and, and because they are beautiful, wonderful things in every culture. And, but also beginning to make yourself part of a cultural context and not always see yourself as an outsider. You know, whether you want to eat igusi soup or you want to have uh, uh, nasi goreng ayam, uh, you know, the different types of foods and you go onto the streets and eat what people eat and to make yourself part of something. And I think this is really important that we cannot, you know, I'm not just doing a job. I'm living a job and I'm not just doing a role. I'm living it and I'm living it together with you as a team, not just instructing you how to do your job, but then I'm not feeling that I'm part of you. And I think, and you are part of me. So I think this thing about being part of is embracing. It's, it's kind of like, you know, I feel every time I move to another country, it's like, I got married again and I moved to another family and I learned the values of that family, if you get what I mean. Yeah. Well, thanks, Danish. That's, that's, that's very interesting. Actually, I have a very interesting takeaway. doesn't matter which culture, which country you're in. I think the smile just works because a smile means a smile everywhere in, in every part of the world. And it, I think, just makes uh, conversations uh, and situations easier. So, uh, you know, I think from the next meeting onwards and as we're all getting back to office, I think we'll see all of us smiling a lot more. That's really wonderful. Thank oh, you so the much. Nations, I have to say the Nations hug emojis on WhatsApp. Because yeah. now he sends you a hug for everything. So I started sending hugs. I tried <laughs> it to Neil, who has still not sent me a hug back. So Neil, I'm waiting <laughs> for you to show me respect from what I've learned from the Nation sent to you. So I'm waiting for that to come back. No, but it, it is actually... Um, you know, I think, Dharnesh, what you talked about, um, you know, going to the driver's house and, you know, I think there's obviously the act of commission in disrespect or respect where it's very outward, but there's also the act of omission, correct? 
and uh, omission is not giving people like what Sunil was saying, your authenticity, a little bit of your heart. And, you know, and I think that is critical because that is, you know, respect. We also say we respect someone, we follow them. I think if you want people to respect you, you have to also be able to give them all this, yeah. Um, so we, we're kind of now moving to what we call Vox Pop Gita. And some of these are actually questions, real questions from, from employees across. Um, and one of the themes that we've seen, uh, you know, uh, resonate quite a lot with people is that of empathy. You know, and, and we all know that empathy is almost the bedrock of respect. Um, you know, you've been meeting employee groups super extensively. You've heard, you know, you must have heard a lot of constant themes around the need for higher empathy. And especially in a time like this, where you your need for being understood, you know, and the need for validation probably is a lot more. Uh, so in these extremely stressful times, how do you think, you know, we, uh, you know, I think all of us, but especially the leadership, could aid people to adopt a more empathetic approach? You know, how do we just ingrain that a lot more around it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the most important thing is that even in a work environment and even when you're on video, are you asking people how they're doing, what's up? You know, maybe it's not on video, but a message, how are you doing? Um, you know, how's your family? I think when, you know, I try, I couldn't keep up eventually about people and their family getting COVID, but sending, you know, early on, we were sending messages to everyone. The senior leadership was doing it. And, you know, there's a, there's a new philosophy called nudges. Actually, we've been thinking about doing some of it on a more systematic, um, systematic way. But actually, the psychological theory of positive overdrive is, have I actually said, I can say one negative thing to you if I've said five positive things, correct? And that's really the psychology of relationship building. So, you know, I know some people who are very masterful at it, but you take time out mm -hmm. <clears throat> once a week to say, you know, I appreciated you about this or how are you doing? So you could actually... Empathy could be even structured and say for someone like me, who's just not naturally empathetic, I have to, I have to, if, if people shared notes, they'd realize sometimes that the, how are you doing? Or thank you for this will sometimes come, you know, because I will remember, okay, I have to reach out um, to people. So I think uh, empathy is, there's a lot of research around it and it's a, it's a, it's a it's a piece that we can sort of uh, really work on. Again, I'll come back to the feedback piece. Mm -hmm. I hear a lot of conversations where people will tell me, so and so did this, correct? Mm -hmm. Or when you're asking for feedback, just talk to that person, correct? Oh. Just, you will be, you know, I shared feedback uh, on Workplace. I think some of you might have seen it. On Friday night, I lost my temper with my kids. And my daughter actually went and, you know, I was reading this parenting book six weeks ago. She actually went, she said, calm down. And she gave me the, she gave me the book, correct? And obviously I calmed down immediately and was like, wow. But if you don't get that feedback, how do you, uh, you know, and I have a suspicion that I should probably be getting more feedback at work because I'm getting feedback every day at home from my children about how I should show up better for them. But I think, you know, the tools to build empathy, but in an organization, I think feedback is also critically, critically important. I want to share on this empathy piece. You know, there's one thing which I've found is that uh, uh, apart from the feedback piece that many times when you just get into even a freewheeling random conversation with people, you know, which is nothing to do with your task at hand or a job at hand. In a freewheeling random conversation, you actually end up picking up some nuggets or some pieces about the person's life or the situation at hand, which actually suddenly gives you a very different perspective, even while discussing the issue at hand. Like, for yeah. example, it's happened in one of the circumstances then when I was talking to somebody during the last you know this COVID lockdown itself 
uh, about a very specific job to be done. And we ended up discussing in the conversation, uh, you know, certain challenges which were happening in moving around that area, which otherwise in Mumbai, maybe I would have taken for granted, you know, that it was actually, uh, you know, things have kind of opened up maybe recently and now it's life reasonably back to normal. And then you suddenly realize that, hey, in that area where this person is staying, uh, it is very difficult to commute still while the whole city seems to have opened. Now mm -hmm. that to my mind is a, I mean, a bit of a, you know, a, 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 you know, a light bulb kind of moment for me, because it just yeah. gave a very different color to me from what I was expecting, yeah. you know, uh, in terms of delivery of the task. And to my mind, that empathy, I would not have had even if I was not doing a, a very, very general discussion. So one thing I've seen normally, uh, and one, one uh, this is what normally I end up doing, you know, that it's good to have maybe sometimes just 10, 15 minute conversation, which have nothing to do with jobs. You do get some of these nuggets, which come out, which come in very handy in building empathy overall with the person. You know. It's in a way, you know, I think especially from what you're saying, particularly, you know, particularly like in the India landscape today, because people are working from home. It's almost like a corridor catch up. It's almost like a little 15 minute coffee break where you may not be discussing work, but you know, just do a quick catch up with people to, to sense what's going on in their life. And I think you just beautifully summed it saying that sometimes you get a perspective that you were not really looking for, uh, you know, proactively, but it just sort of got thrown off at you. And actually that changed your point of view about, uh, you know, someone else. So I think that's another thing. Uh, uh, yeah. Yes, I, I just, I want to share something that, and this is many years before this global pandemic, right? So I was succeeding somebody in, in, in a leadership position and I went to this country. And, uh, but part of the handover brief was the people here are really poor on time management. They ne people are never good on to attend meetings on time. So my predecessor always had an eight o'clock in the morning meeting. And he says 50% of the people will be late for your meeting. So he was giving me like, you know, what are the challenges? So I sat there, I followed his diary for the first two weeks because he had set up all the meetings and I was also getting annoyed. You know, you start talking and then somebody else comes in and somebody else. And, and then, I, then I thought to myself, I need to ask why, right? Because you see, the perception is these people are just not disciplined on time management. So I, I, I called the head of HR and I said, what is the challenge? And she said to me, she says, look, this is, we you know, we have to teach people discipline and we have to, you know, but it's, it's not in the culture, etc." So I said, but what is really the challenge? She says, I don't know. So I said, okay, I'm going to do a survey. So, you know, normally you want to do all these fancy formal surveys. So what I did is I walked around the desk and a lot of, and the people who are reporting to me directly, like the head of a, of a marketing team and Oh, no, I'm really sorry. I had to drop my kid off at school. I'm really sorry. I had to drop my kid off at the mother-in-law's house. So, so everybody was having this and then the, the traffic. So everybody has a challenge because mm -hmm. schools only open at a certain time. So even if they leave at five o'clock in the morning, there's still nobody to collect the kid at school or, or some people have little babies. So I realized that people are doing their best to overcome this challenge. And we have never asked them, why is it that you're late? But we're just like not happy with people being late. Yeah. I just moved all the meetings to start at nine o'clock. I never had a problem again. So you see, sometimes I think this thing about asking, like, so ask me and, and just do it in a nice way. In fact, sometimes doing formal surveys are actually not helpful because people think it's big brother is watching, right? So sometimes you need to do this info. Like, so what is really the issue? And, and how long does it take you to drive? And uh, where does who's taking care of the kid while you're at work? So just breaking down those things, it, sh it actually is empathizing, but it is showing the real respect. I respect you as a mother. I respect you as a father, as a parent. And I respect the fact that you have a challenge and that, you know, traffic is a nightmare. And actually, who invented the thing of eight o'clock meetings anyway? You know, why can't we have it at nine and make sure that we, we do what we need to do? Yeah. And that everybody, you know, it's like, I hate early morning meetings. I need to collect. I like to spend the first half an hour, one hour at the office, collecting my thoughts, um, going through mail, etc. Rushing into the office, dropping your bag, and rushing into a meeting and thinking I'm going to be productive uh, is is not 
Firstly, we're not empathizing. We're also showing disrespect. And that person then in turn shows you what you think is disrespect for time management. So I think sometimes it's just about being misunderstood or not really understanding it. what exactly is the challenge. Very interesting points you're making because you're actually saying that, you know, when we lack empathy, that, you know, that of course spirals into a lot of other negative emotions. But what that also does is it actually impacts your productivity, right, as, as employees. I mean, very often, uh, you know, there is also a little bit of this, uh, you know, I think it's somewhere sort of settles in your head thinking, you know, this person doesn't understand what I'm going through. Now, because nobody is breaking that barrier of having a conversation, both are building that kind of a perception in their minds, and that's obviously not helping anyone. So I think, you know, what I'm hearing all of you say, uh, you know, something that probably we would all know, but we don't do or don't sort of demonstrate that very often, which is just about, you know, picking up the phone on another individual or, you know, catching up and saying, just what's going on, you know, and, and genuinely and authentically trying to understand and be in their shoes. Um, you know, there is a spin to this this whole this whole point around empathy, especially in the corporate world. And this is a question both to Dharmesh and Sunil. You know, in the pandemic, you know, we've obviously seen that together as teams, you know, as as all cross-functional teams coming together, we've managed to pretty much achieve un the unthinkable milestone. But as leaders of multiple functions, do you very often come across situations where you sense a lack of cross-functional empathy? You know, where you feel that, you know, uh, one function probably doesn't perceive the issues uh, or doesn't appreciate the concerns, you know, of another function, while you as a leader can see all of it. So how do you, um, uh, you know, uh, address some of those? How do you sort of try and build stronger cross-functional empathy? You know, one is about empathy for each other as individuals, but the other is also about appreciating the challenges that, you know, each of us are going through. For example, during the pandemic, you know, we, we saw that the frontline teams and then, you know, our factory teams were clearly the ones that were going to some of the toughest challenges, you know, while everyone had their own challenges, but they were really out there. So as leaders, you know, how do you build, build that empathy? Sunil, I'll come to you first and, and, and then we shall come to you um, post uh, Sunil. Uh, uh, Anusha, your voice isn't breaking. Am I audible? I just wanted to check. Is there a problem? Yeah. At my end? Sorry, uh, have uh, I am audible? audible? Yeah, 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 audible. Yeah. Yep. So is my question clear, Sunil? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are. You can't okay. hear us? Because there was a... No, no, it's, uh, I, because I was not... I, Anusha, I understood your question. It's just that I wanted to check that, uh, you know, there was a bit of a break happening. So, yeah, Anusha, uh, so this, 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 is a, this is a problem which always exists, you know, that... Uh, as large, as organizations, and this is a challenge not normally of a smaller organization. As mm -hmm. organizations get bigger and bigger, and uh, you know, functions themselves have sub functions below that, there is definitely these plays tend to come in that uh, you know, you would not see the other side and the challenges with the other function feels uh, so clearly. And I can tell you in the pandemic, there have been examples on this. Despite, I think, uh, a while as a team, we have really delivered on you know overall goals and i think the agility and the collaboration of the team has gone on a very very different level but there is one challenge when you talk about it which would still come in for example uh, you know you will feel some of our smaller businesses talking about that uh, maybe our supply chain has not been able to service them the way smaller businesses would have expected despite and we knew that maybe there were some very conscious calls which were taken uh, similarly you would find out uh, that you know there would be talks about how maybe uh, there could have been more agility shown by, let's say, our marketing teams to service the demand creation pieces of, uh, you know, uh, some of our brands. So I think those conversations are uh, real in our mind. And those are issues which have happened. The way I would uh, normally handle this is that I think uh, this message has to start from the first, the top level. And then there's a second role which comes of the uh, people at the, uh, you know, uh, middle and lower level. I think first the, the management committee itself level needs to be very, very empathetic of each other. I think that's where it starts. If, for example, uh, you know, a Pradeep understands the challenges which, let's say, Palvi is going through to service the, or, or let's say Rob is empathetic of the challenges that Palvi's team is going through in trying to meet even, uh, let's say, maybe a, stri a strike rate or a fill rate of me in these times, 70% happen. Uh, we know 70% is not good enough. I think that empathy comes. Then what would happen is that the two teams would sit down together and find maybe a third route, which will become much more win-win for the organizations. And this is something which I've seen uh, that uh, 
top leadership sitting down talking and understanding each other's challenges and problems empathetically is a very very important starting point because then the solutions start flowing because you know each other's constraints secondly and this is true more of i would say definitely gcpl dna uh, we are an organization which works a lot through relationships across the organization and i mean we love working that way that where people like reaching out to each other understanding supporting each other and those relationships to do matter right and whether it's so you've these got tough times or even otherwise i think it's important for sorry okay. am i audible yeah 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 audible you got stuck in between for a second you're audible now okay it is very important that for our our middle and you know front line leadership teams also to be in continuous conversations because finally while one hand is mandating at the top and trying to understand things from the top the other thing is the best solutions happen when people at the in in the last mile understand each other's issues so i think this empathy the functional empathy can be created in two ways i think the first is the management committee the top leadership the vertical leadership sitting down and understanding the solutions and i have seen most times when they talk a third solution comes in which is a much more optimal solution than a standoff and the second other thing is the front lines need to be consistently uh, reaching out to each other you know so i would i would say this is the best way to manage and i think in the pandemic we have seen one of the reasons why we as a company got out of the blocks faster than anybody else in the first quarter is because yeah. not because it was me mandating i think it was maybe the way each factory units were talking to the local sales guys they were in touch with each other it is the way let's say pradeep amit uh, palvi rob they were conversing with each other on a day to day basis with the way marketing teams were talking to them i think that leadership touch points in trying to understand and finding solutions was the way we move forward you know perfect sounds great to me so very clearly i think every layer needs to just converse more comes back really to talking more feedbacking into each other but trying to arrive at common solution or solution ganesh uh, you know have you uh, you know and i'm sure you would have, have sort of you know faced similar you know kind of cross functional uh, run down sometime you know do you think there are from your perspective any better ways of building that kind of cross functional empathy yeah so so maybe i am going to talk in a, in a few ways one is the biggest enemy of working together is a thing called ego and i and i think we have got to really understand that sometimes we create egos by having uh, organizational levels and it's, but when when teams have less ego in terms of my function is more important than your function or i am more senior than you and if we cut out the clutter of ego and we become real then we start going back to what is our common purpose right and i think we feel start rallying around what is our common purpose be real cut out the ego but then bring in the most important thing that you know we 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 talked about a lot of nice things about respect empathy yeah. and why we need but we also need part of being respectful is also being genuine and and also being uh, truthful and transparent to say look i'm sorry this is not the right way i'm sorry this should be done in another way so if you know goes back to the 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 the, the talk, talk about authenticity so if you be real in in bringing challenge respectful doesn't mean i don't challenge you in yeah. fact i am more respectful because i'm challenging you and i think that mindset is something it's not easy because there's another element called ego so i think if you if you you know in an ideal world nobody has to have titles and in an ideal world no one has layers and everything but i think if we could just our go back to what is our mission our purpose and what we are trying to do what we are trying to achieve together as one team rather than me playing politics to boost my own ego to i don't know what maybe somebody will say something nice about me or 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 some other reward that i'm looking for so i think for me it's really attacking this thing about you know put your ego in your pocket and let's see and it's not it's not a nice thing to hear right if somebody told me can you put your ego in your pocket and do what's right for for your team and to do what's right for the whole organization but the first time i i, I heard it it was like what 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 is somebody saying to me but when i begin to understand what it means that this collective we are much stronger as a collective we will find solutions together 
as a collective far better than we will ever as individuals. So I think this, but it's something we have to continue talking about. We have to talk about the collective, how we are stronger together. And I know, you know, we've been talking a lot about it. We will emerge stronger together, right? And I think getting more of that and, and not allowing. So leaders have a responsibility not to allow ego to permeate in such a negative way that starts destroying the spirit of people. And I think this thing about, and this is so, so that's how I would really focus on this. Thank you, Dennis. And you know, you touched upon a very important point of being real. So, you know, being respectful does not mean that, uh, you know, you will not take challenges head on. And I like to say this is flowing because that kind of brings us to, you know, in a way, our next segment, uh, you know, for, for everything like respect, you know, life, life appreciation, there are always certain, you know, myths that kind of tend to surround uh, some of these concepts. And, and Nisa, I'm coming to you with this question first, but, you know, very often we hear leaders and managers uh, being caught up in this very classic conundrum of, you know, I have a business deliverable, but, you know, when I'm demanding, would I be seen, you know, would that make me sort of seen as someone who's harsh, you know, someone who's tough, and in effect, would I be seen to be disrespectful? So, especially again at a time, you know, where, where people genuinely are battling a lot of personal challenges, you know, managing work and home, uh, what is your advice to people to, you know, to, uh, to sort of, uh, you know, deliver on on results uh without you know without necessarily sort of you know feeling the pressure of being seen to be disrespectful how do you pull the two apart but again i'll come back to this act of like commission and omission so if you're like screaming at people and just behaving like an asshole then like there's no question i mean that's just ridiculous and you cannot say that because that's the only way i can get results that means you can't uh you don't know how to lead. I think the example actually that Dharnesh gave was a very powerful one, correct? Shifting the meeting from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. So I think the thing is that we ha- we will, we are, you know, I am always going to demand performance. I'm always going to ask tough questions. Some meetings will get rough if something's not going right. And by rough, I don't mean that, okay, I'm going to talk to someone disrespectfully, but I'm going to ask the, you know, and you might not think the fact is the way I see the fact and you have an opportunity to explain it, but this is part of doing business. I think the idea it's disrespectful when, you know, things are last minute or you're telling someone make a 200th slide presentation for Nisa when actually they actually have to get something out for a customer and doing that work for me is not a you know priority. So I'm saying leadership, actually, if there is a lot to be done, our job as leaders is to help prioritize. Our job is to say, if I move the meeting from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., it will help people, correct? So I think the idea is not to be disrespectful, the idea is to how do you increase productivity? How do you increase? That is the work of leadership, correct? And the best leaders get the results and they're loved for it and people want to work for them. And yeah, maybe not, you know, maybe there will be a weekend that you do have to work or there will be sometimes where we will have to sort of uh, stretch. But to say that I, I, and I see when people tell me that, oh, it's because I push my team, that's why I'm getting my feedback. I love to tell them, but there are people who are getting better results than you whose team loves yeah. them. So there is, uh, you know, the, the, it, it doesn't have to, it doesn't have to go. It, it, it's not that, you know, people like to be pushed. People like to be asked to do uh, uh, you know, they don't they don't respect people who don't, you know, lead mm. them forward. So, so I don't think those two things have to. And anyone who thinks they have to go hand in hand, uh, is has got is not got their head screwed on totally right. Sorry for that disrespectful comment, but yeah. You're effectively saying that you know sometimes it's all right to appear to be maybe a little unpopular. As long as you're being just, as long as you know you're being fairly thought, thoughtful. Yeah, about- it's not. No, yeah, it's it's not about. I mean, it's not about. It's not about. I I think if you come into 
every day at work and say i want to be liked that's yeah. you know mm-hmm. you should you want to be respected you want to treat people with dignity but i'm saying this idea that to get results you have to be whacking people or pushing them is not right correct if that is if people if that is what you think is happening you need to step back and dhanesh gave us that wonderful thing of changing 8 am to 9 maybe you need to prioritize better maybe you need to coach a team member better maybe you need to ask the you know ask better questions because yeah. obviously just beating people is not the way to get results so anuja if i if i may um, you know one of the challenges i had was coming into a new organization in such a wonderful time was you know what can value can i add and i think it's important so it's it's you know if if i was just going to ask my team you know that's your aop and you have to deliver the numbers and why are you not doing it then i have zero value because an excel will tell them that right i think my value will how can i help you to realize or is there some solution we can find together can i can i point you in a direction so i think this thing of being you know what lisa was saying our role is to also guide our role is to is to present scenarios and present possibilities right so in a way we are we are we are delivering possibilities so so you know as leaders because people want possibility and if you just going to you know yes i need you we need to achieve our ambition but if i'm only going to tell you about the ambition we're not teaching counseling coaching how we're going to get there then it doesn't have the same you know can imagine if we shape a thing together we find new ways to fight and then we achieve together is it so amazing as opposed to okay that's what i want you to do uh call me at the end of the year when it's done i mean then then actually the whole year I have zero value so I, i i get a salary for doing nothing because i've already given you the aop target i don't need to tell you I, every once a month i will tell you why you're not achieving you take the big stick and you know so i think i think this is where the shifting and, and actually everybody in organization should be doing this we should all be asking how can i help yeah. how can we find solutions together because I am sure we have the most amazing ideas in the most weird places that we will find in the organization. And I'm sure Sunny will tell you the sales guys in India know things about the business better than all of us. And the the guy at the lowest level of the organization who's selling that one extra case in the end of the month is the guy who really even knows the offtake. He can tell you who the consumer is better than any research report, right? So I think listening to that as well becomes important. that's very sound advice uh, that is especially just as we are getting into our aop season to say don't just tell your teams to make decks right but i think to really work through with them right work oh. show them solutions guide them but let them still deliver uh, to their potential and you know and and to sort of unravel their potential i think it's a very interesting point you made around leadership you know where it's it's about balancing uh, being great and being a nice leader while at the same time uh you know letting your team uh, uh you know reach its fullest potential thanks so much for that one uh so really i think this is this is a this is a question that you know that i think many people people would sort of you know love to hear from you you know you're a very passionate propagator of the challenger mindset you know and, and arguably there could have been no better testing times for that concept have you ever faced situa- a situation where people would have mistaken a challenger mindset to mean added pressure to be seen as you know being extremely demanding and to be seen almost as insensitive yeah so for uh, first of all you know again i think uh, we have discussed this in the past as well that challenger mindset is really about going back and challenging our own path dependence our own preconceived notions of models the way we worked in the past and uh, challenging those models right from the scratch and then doing everything with a very bold ambition and some serious constraints as we call it i think that's challenge of behavior now what this would mean is that we would definitely we will defi- definitely demand more of each other but the point really is demanding more of each other does not necessarily mean that we have to do it and do it disrespectfully i think that's a very important you know uh, you know line to uh, you know keep in mind that you can actually be demanding of each other you can actually behave more challenger and do it while showing respect to each other because the whole very basis of 
this new behavior is that we'll do what we have never attempted before. And for that, we will all have to get out of our comfort zones. Right. And getting out of comfort zones will be tough. It will have moments which will be uh, painful, right? Now, the question is, in those painful moments, we should not, in fact, become insensitive to the pain. The What, in fact, to mind is converse is true. That when you're attempting those painful transitions, that's the time to be actually more sensitive to each other. And that is the hallmark of respect in those times. So to my mind, challenger behavior from my incumbency behavior is that as we make some very painful calls, as we make pain, as we take some unknown bold risks, we need to actually be sensitive to the risk that we're taking, that we could falter on the way and handhold each other. And in the past, I also have seen, I can tell you, uh, you know, this is a question which has come up many times from many teams saying that, okay, if we are going to show respect to our distributors, if we're going to show respect to, uh, you know, uh, our uh, vendor partners or to our employees who are, uh, we believe have gaps in their performance, that question comes up. Then yeah. how can I put together, a, a, a you know, an uh, expectation of improving your performance uh, yeah. while being respected? This is a very often question comes. You know, to my mind, actually, uh, the biggest thing to know is that when you're expecting people, people actually would love it when you can actually get into a conversation with them. Be very open to listening. That's a very important trait that you understand and hear where they are coming from. The moment you listen, you need to be open to saying, okay, let's understand their perspective where they are coming from. That is, I think, half the battle won. When they understand the perspective, you understand their perspective. And then if you can give them feedback with evidences, with examples, there are many times people who otherwise would not understand, they will be very open to understanding, okay, this is a perspective I did not see. The question is this feedback need not be just, you know, here's here. You tell them, okay, okay this is the way we, uh, this happened. This is what transpired. So these two acts of listening, the second act of giving a feedback where you're putting together the expectation with examples and then stating up the third act of saying, okay, now you tell me if we all like both agree on this, what help you need to achieve this. To me, in a way, these three acts can make a very, very tough conversation reach its conclusion of being demanding while being respectful. So I think this is something which I have uh, you know, learned and this is something which I've seen. I can tell you one example is that not here, but I mean, in the, in the past happened that there was, uh, you know, one of the top performer uh, persons in our teams, you know, in the past, which I had encountered uh, was, had been always been doing well. And one of the challenges for that person was that uh, it was a classic transition, which had had to happen, let's say, from uh, being, let's say, area manager role to a zonal manager role. Now that role required a potential building capabilities of being able to lead the managers for the first time in life. The person was a hypo star. You, I mean, never ever in 99 out of 100 times would have missed his targets. And it was always given to the person that you would ultimately transit to the next role of a ZSM. Now that conversation I still remember. And that conversation, the person actually walked in thinking, this is my entitlement, right? But the way that conversation went is that first you actually acknowledge the fact that this person is genuinely a value-added asset to the company. But if you then showed evidences, and we did talk about that for being a ZSM, what are the new things that person would need to take a leap on? And that conversation, I remember it was maybe a two hour conversation, uh, that second down of you know examples saying, what is it required to make the transition from a brilliant ASM to a good ZSM was a lighthouse moment in that conversation. And the way it ended was instead of saying, okay, I get it or I would leave, to think, okay, now help me make this transition. So that's an example of actually a, a hyper conversation which moved from saying, okay, I'm entitled to saying, you know, I understand what I need to do. You tell me how you can work jointly with me on this. So I think uh, the point which I'm making is demanding can happen brilliantly along with respect if you can do these three things together. So I think actually what I'm hearing both you and Ramesh, uh, you know, as a senior leaders say is that uh, you know, I think just a le the lesson in respect is actually a lesson in leadership because it's eventually about 
uh, you know, setting tough targets, but it's also about handholding. It's also about having the right kind of conversations, building the right temperament. Uh, you know, and and again, I think helping people realize where they may be going wrong while not necessarily dropping them off in the wrong place. We're kind of heading just towards. One, I'm sorry, maybe just one thing, which maybe uh, one one nuance which I've seen. is that if the discussion can even a tough conversation if it becomes not about the personality but and it is about the issue in which you want to help the person i think that's that, that, that distinction is very important many times it becomes it's my personality versus your personality if it is about the issue in hand and how we are actually the genuineness comes across that you are trying to help me into it i think a very tough conversation can be done with respect and can become very very meaningful Yeah, I think it's if you take people, is it? Do you have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Correct. And fixed mindset is saying that this person cannot change; they cannot be better, and they're just like that. And then you know, I'm you know, or growth mindset is that people fundamentally can change. So I don't say that they are bad or this is wrong, or uh, that they are wrong or they are bad, but. This is this thing that they've been doing can actually be improved on. So how you give feedback is even very critical feedback can be given in an inspiring way. So yeah, it's a very interesting point you're making. You can you know as we kind of get into the last segment of this conversation, you know we didn't spoke about what respect means and so on. Now you know eventually it is uh you know it's absolutely human to err, and I think one of the important questions is that. especially at gcpl right uh, i think one question to you is you know if someone feels disrespected if they feel that uh, you know they've been going through something that's putting them at at this ease what do you think they should be doing you know you of course spoke about going and talking to the person with whom you know they're, they're sort of developing this feeling but but do you have any other avenues where you know people can walk up and and you know maybe just talk about these issues well i think obviously if you you know if you've self reflected and you realize or someone's given you feedback an apology is the simplest thing to do and especially if it's genuinely meant just say sorry like you know we all we are all screwing up on a daily basis it's not like i'm sure that there are people watching this show and saying ha huh, these three are now or four of them are talking about respect let you know let me give you xyz example maybe they'll all message us now after we've asked for all this feedback so guys we're waiting for it don't forget the hug emoji at the end of the feedback but i think you know uh just just uh, apologize correct or or reach out Uh, or reach out uh, to that person, right? Have a conversation with them. Say, can I have a drink with you? It's you can always repair these things. And on the same side, instead of you know, if someone you you felt not respected or not included or whatever, just reach out. Most of the time, the person wouldn't even have uh, have a uh, note. And I know, like you know, I I mean. I don't know if Raul wanted me to share this sort of um, like publicly, but he, I think, early on in the pandemic, on a team meeting, I think, lost his temper with uh, with someone. He didn't mean, you know. Obviously, sometimes these things happen. He actually called me up to say, "Can you?" He apologized. but you know this is a very valuable team member i really stepped over the line i shouldn't have can you call them also and speak to them and just make sure that they're okay so you can i mean obviously if he's calling me to tell it's like a you know so i'm just saying that we will make mistakes but you can you we can really and i thought that was a moment of leadership to say i made a mistake but let's this person's very valuable i actually you know respect them a lot you know so i think i think it's about feedback i think it's about conversations none of us are perfect and i think if we collectively understand that we can build a better organization thanks neeta benish coming to you uh you know are there any anecdotes i think it'll be very interesting for people to hear some anecdotes from you know from all of you where neeta just spoke about one where you know where where the Without line permission <laughs> when now you said it would have you know the line clearly would have been told but as a leader how did you help that individual 
uh, you know, almost redeem themselves? You know, how did you, you know, in, in a sense, what is your advice to people when a situation like this comes up? One, how do you watch out or how do you, you know, help sort of point out to people if they may just be bordering, being disrespectful? And if a situation like that happens, which is absolutely real, how do you not make that individual feel singled out, but, you know, let them, you know, let them sort of, you know, get, get past that and, and make peace with it? So uh, I'm going to try and be uh, also be very uh, transparent and authentic. Uh, you know, for example, there are many areas within the Guam team that we've had governance issues, right? And for whatever reason, and if people in leadership positions have to have to take responsibility, they have to understand that the openness to seeing what I can do to improve, to fix, and the commitment to do that is the one part. But if you are not open to that, then suddenly this whole issue on governance is going to become a personal thing. And I think this, so one of the things I realized up front was, is it the person who's just, you know, bad or... Is there something wrong with the structure, the system, the process, and maybe just even mindset, right? So really understanding, I think Sunil talked about it as well, is let's go back to what is the real issue. And you start carving it out and peeling the onion, right? You're peeling the onion and it's going to make you cry. But when you get to what's really inside this onion, and, and so I think in a similar way, you will have to go through this process of being painful to say, look, I'm sorry, this is unacceptable. This is not the way we... This is not our values. This is not how we do business. This is not the Godrich way. And But you have to go through that process. And rather than just holding the person accountable and not understanding what were, what caused this. And I think you also reached a, a, a break point. And the break point to me is if after peeling the onion, nobody is crying and everyone's still pointing fingers the other ways and saying it's not my fault, it's somebody else's fault, then I have a problem. So I think this, this collective uh, embracing of, we have a challenge, we have a problem, and we have to fix it together. So, so at some stage, you also have to have breakpoints. And the breakpoint is, everyone around can be trying to fix a problem, but if there's somebody who has such a closed mindset and will not change and carries on, you know, putting the fingers the other way as people do in some time, then, it be, then you also have a responsibility to say, look, I'm sorry. This doesn't work. So, but I do think allowing people to go to a process rather than judging, uh, which is so easy to do. You know, you just look at the what you call facts, right? So we look at the at the issues and we say these are the facts. But we also got to understand what is what has caused the facts, as we we say it. So I, I I think the the one it was a it was a big lesson for me. You know, in this last uh, ten months, eight months, nine months, or whatever, I had to go through this process of saying, okay, hold on. We have a big issue here. And it is a burning platform. It is, it is not good, but we have to fix it. Now, the, the easy one was to just, you know, everybody is bad. Therefore, everybody needs to be changed. And, whatever. and, and I think it's important that we, okay, but let's understand why. So beginning to understand why, but at the same time, the other end of the why is there has to be a committed, responsible action. It's not just why for the sake of why. You only ask why because I need to fix it because it is not right. Because our values is more important than what your AOP number is. And I think that, that mindset, I don't know if I, I've, I've tried to, to explain it in the right way. And, and, and I, think it, it, I think the beauty of this conversation is that all of you are bringing in personal examples and uh, you know, very real situations. I think that, that makes it so much more relatable. Uh, just getting to really the last question, and I promise to everyone because we're very respectful of your time, uh, you know, and we've got a couple of meetings after this. So um, one last question, uh, you know, they say that, it, it, you know, we all know that a positive affirmation, you know, always goes a long way. Um, so Sunil, I'm going to first come to you to ask you this question, but how do you really think that appreciation can be a great tool for fostering, towards fostering respect? Yeah, so, uh, you know, in fact, there's one uh, uh, difference which I have always seen that, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, hanker after a lot of, uh, you know, awards. You know, this Godrej Award is a very, very, you know, uh, prestigious thing in our organization. And I've seen, and Isa has, has been part of the most 
last decisive uh, you know uh, winners and losers battles on there uh, in the in the green room or the black room whatever it is but you know uh, and i know people for people such big awards do matter a lot because they are prestigious you know that would many times really give you high but i've seen one thing you know despite having so many awards so many recognitions there is one feedback that we normally tend to get in most of our in tunes and most of our uh, you know uh, 360s is that uh, and this comes second a uh, third after career pieces you know is that uh, there's not enough recognition happening you know and then uh, i and rahul have been chatting about it and you know one thing i've realized is that awards can give you only so much of a momentary high of at best a week and then yeah. it withers away what yeah. keeps the things going is to people's are maybe small pats on the back which yeah. are concurrent and in the moments yeah right and i think those are something which uh, maybe keep the adrenaline going keep you fighting hard even in the most toughest of times and those are maybe the ones which people remember more then the awards which you know after a week are actually forgotten by everybody so i think uh, one of the pieces definitely res- uh, respect is uh, the small moments of of touch points of appreciation which are just in the flow yeah. as and when it's happening and i think that's very important whether it's a thank you or whether it's saying great well done but in the moment in the flow pats on the back i think are what matters however as leaders we should make sure that these in the flow moments of thank yous and appreciations are also have two characters to it one is they are deserving yeah even no matter how much small it's deserving and secondly it is genuine that you yeah. 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 otherwise every people will see through it over a period yeah. of time that you are just saying it for the heck of it so i think the way to do it will be more than the big awards it is actually the in the flow pats on the back which matter make it authentic make it uh, that you didn't genuinely mean it and they are genuinely deserving we see agree we agree with you sanil uh danish and you know this is this is literally our last question to to all of you uh danish uh, you know again any examples where you seen appreciation uh, you know do a lot better for building a respectful environment uh, you know where you can sort of share some you know examples with us any incidents sure uh, I, I was thinking about this. Uh, you know, uh, the one thing I want to say is, do you know? I still get excited. I know, like one of the oldest guys on GCPL Mancom, but I still get excited when my boss tells me, "Great job." So I, I think this, this, this. I know, you know, you think by fifty-five years old, you kind of get over that, and you don't. And I think this, this human thing of being recognized for something, or and it's not for you. It's like then I go send a message to the team. Guess what? The boss is so happy, right? and it's not because of the boss it's just that like we've achieved something so i think every human being wants to have recognition and i think suri's point is super right but but i do think this this recognition is also a recognition of what it takes yeah. so you know there's this there's this is uh, a legendary story about me getting on a motorcycle in indonesia and then selling product on the motorcycle and it was so funny because i'm not fluent in bahasa but i was going to the storekeepers and selling cases of product actually they were being nice to me and buying right it wouldn't i'm sure they wouldn't have bought anyway just they thought it was funny but riding that motorcycle and then it started raining and you know doing that it became you know the sales guys were taking videos and it it spread across the entire country and it became such a big thing but the appreciation for the fact that you know you sit in your ivory tower in your fancy office with all the air conditioning and there are people who are doing the real tough stuff and but you've taken the time out to sit there and feel our the tough things right and i think this is where we have to respect that some of us kind of need to recognize and actually appreciate what everyone in the organization is doing because if that sales guy does not deliver that or if the person in the factory is not you know taking the forklift and getting it off off the pallet nothing happens so so i think this this thing of you know respecting everyone has a role to play and appreciating them for that you know it's just walking in uh, i'm sure i've i've seen a lot of good posts on on this but it's so important and i know the first time i went to the subinite factory in johannesburg or then i went to the the inecto factory in in durban and just tell him you are the heroes and 
people feel good because it is true that the real hero. So I think it's important that we always tell and say who's really making this organization. And I feel that, you know, just saying it and respecting it. There is no award. There's no monetary. There's no nothing else. Just yeah. saying, I really, really appreciate what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Positive affirmation yeah. actually goes a long way. And there's a, there's a whole host of sort of research that tells you that it's probably a stronger motivator than sometimes a more structured award. These are finally coming to you. You know, we all know that. Yeah, and I think. Yeah. Nisa, yeah. we all know, and I'm kind of go sharing ahead, this personal ahead. anecdote, you know, getting an appreciation out of you is tough. But when you get it out, you know, when one gets it from you, we know it's, we want it, right? Because I think you don't mince words, right? So, uh, you know, you've got a very nice way of, 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 of giving appreciation. You know, you, you, you tell people what's right, but you also tell them what could have been better. So, you know, is, is there some, you know, is there, is this something that you've cultivated over time or do you have a certain way of, of giving appreciation or, you know, something that you... No, I think, I think, I think my sort of biggest thing is, am I being genuine with people, correct? Am I being fully authentic? And, you know, sometimes on this WhatsApp group, something will come and everyone will be great. If I don't think it's great, I just stay quiet. Obviously, I don't go and say, oh, this is not good. Now, I guess everyone will know. I don't reply but so I think being genuine is very important because I think then when you do say well done or this is great then people know it's not just being said in passing but you really mean it I think the one journey that I'm on that you know and I think COVID has been a big eye opener is I think one is the appreciation for the good work the appreciation okay this was a great campaign you know you delivered results but I think the other is just the appreciation that we're all humans that we're all in it together that you are like actually seen and you know I think for me again because of being introverted not, you know it's not something that I have needed so much but realizing people need it and just actually working with someone like Dhruv this year who became my EA you know, he actually checks on me, how are you doing today, Nisa, correct? And not many people do that with me, but it actually feels so nice because someone actually, he's not saying, oh, Nisa, you did a great job. He's just saying, how are you doing today? So I think if we can do more of that as an organization and for each other, that will make us, it's just, it's, our, it's I guess it's our basic human need and the more the more we can show that to each other the better the collaboration the better the inclusion the better the discussions and potentially more fun to work together i think you know we uh, i i'm really hoping that everyone's taken down their notes you know on what it takes to be respectful and what it takes to be a great leader i really want to thank uh, all three of you nisa sunil dhanish personally for me it's been a very enriching uh, conversation I think we all need to sort of go back reflect do you know sort of utilize your post dinner time today to just think what could you do better as you know what we all could do better as uh, you know as as people I think as humans everyone around us could do with a little bit of appreciation and feedback with that we're signing out of this uh, session of the real deal thank you so much Anuja right. thank you thank Take you care, everybody Take care, bye. Bye. bye bye bye